Welcome to the Liberty Insider. This is a program that brings you news, updates, analysis, and general information on religious liberty events in the US and around the world. My name is Lincoln Steed, editor of Liberty Magazine, and my guest on this program is Tina Ramirez, founder and president of Hardwired. And not the first time you've been on this program. I'm sure we have regular viewers that uh, have already heard you explain your organization which is doing leading edge education uh, all around the world. But what impresses me particularly is in Iraq, dealing with uh, people that have been damaged by that whole uh, civil war situation, ISIS and so on. Uh, but you also have a background uh, working at, at quite high levels in the US government as, as a, how would you, what, what are your positions? I don't want to characterize them. No, no, it's them. great. Thank you for yeah, having me I know you've worked here. in congressional offices <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and different advisory yeah. capacities. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the US. Great. In my view, the US, like every country, is facing severe challenges on all levels at the moment. And with the political, maybe not instability, but political dynamism of the moment, I think we're even having to sort of look again, you know, what's religious liberty, civil liberties, how do they fit into this? Yeah. You know, what's the situation today? It, it clearly is not, no, not business as usual, is it? No, and thank you for having me again, Lincoln. It's great to My be with pleasure. you. My pleasure. Yeah, the, um, so Hardwired, the organization that I founded, uh, provides education and training in religious freedom around the world and establishes leadership in countries where there is none uh, mm -hmm. so that we can begin to turn the tide against persecution. But obviously, this is still a hot issue in America and in many Western countries. Um, where the, the freedom is beginning to come under attack or just is being is being threatened in different ways. And uh, so it's been interesting because at the organization, we've been looking at how do you raise up younger generations to care about this human right in order to preserve it for um, not only people around the world, but for future generations here for as well. For now, preserve yeah, it for, for today. Here. Right. We for, can lose it today. For here, right. So, so this is something that we've been looking yeah. at. And uh, in working in the U.S. Congress, we focused primarily on uh, international religious freedom issues, but also on some domestic issues as well. So it's a, it's a very different, um, it's a very different uh, landscape here in the United States as it, than it is in other countries. It's not life and death realities, but it's... Um, it's still, there are many issues in America where the freedom of conscience is definitely coming under threat um, in many different, in diverse ways and on both sides of the aisle. So it, it's a very interesting time. Well, it's not, maybe not life or death and you know, the, the, your head's gonna be severed <laughs> in, in no. the moment, but people's livelihood is, yeah. is often on the line and, right. and you can't survive long without a uh, reasonable income and, and right. a place in society. So it's very important. Right, and I think that one of the greatest challenges is that um, the general public just isn't aware of the implications of, of, um, of limiting the freedom of conscience and belief for people of faith or, or you know people across the country. And so, I mean, you come from a community, religious community, that this is, mm -hmm. this is embedded in who you are. Um, you know, Sabbath, taking the Sabbath day, keeping it holy, not working. Uh, another community, uh, you, I mean, there are a lot of different religious communities like Jehovah's Witnesses that, you know, the blood transfusion issue, or if you look, or, and not um, pledging the allegiance, certain things. I mean, there are a lot of communities that have certain conscientious objections or to different issues as a matter of faith. And for them, it would be their ability to live out their faith is being threatened right now right. by a society that wants to say, no, you should have to just fall in line with the culture. Right. Sort of a uniformity. Yeah. Right. And, and what you're getting at, I don't know if you've ever expressed or thought of it this way, but to me, there's true religious liberty that you understand very well and we talk about, uh, but a lot of what passes for religious liberty now is religious entitlement. Mm. Like my group wants this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm restricted, it could even be Seventh Avenue. I mean, we're not necessarily mm. doing that, but. It could be I'm fighting for accommodation on my holy day, but I'm not overly moved by someone else's. Religious liberty has to be for all. Oh, absolutely. Or it doesn't work for anyone, essentially. Yeah, and in working in Washington, I think that's one of the great things that you've seen is that you've seen a lot of diverse groups come together and work together on these different policy issues. So uh, there are a lot of networks, even with secular humanists that are working with um, yeah. 
with religious communities on different issues and they can that they can come together on. Mm -hmm. So the, the Workplace Religious Freedom Act is one of those yeah. and, and there are a number of other issues. I think healthcare was another one where a number of communities were very concerned about the Im implications for conscience. And conscience has such a long in history tradition in America that it's affected so many different groups in different ways that it's everything from conscience objection to warfare to you know the Pledge of Allegiance to you just you you know the to healthcare, so it runs the gamut of of groups across the board that um, want to be able to say that it's it's my right to. And yet it's very interesting. Do X, Y, or Z. Conscience issues, historically and even legally, it doesn't have to be religion, and yet you and I know that mm -hmm. the, the, the conscience is almost a spiritual concept, isn't it? That you, the, 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 there's a divine spark that you're responding to that certainly. Uh, religious values inform you, uh, a, tr a good conscience. Well, yeah, and when we're applying within uh, the context of U.S. law, we're looking at the deeply held religious convictions Personal that somebody, view, yeah. somebody has, not just a certain idea about right and wrong, but it has to be, it's connected. And I think this is what it makes... It doesn't even have to be perceived right. legally as right or wrong. If they hold right. it deeply, it's to be respected. Yeah. And this is what makes religious freedom so different than other political rights, like free yeah. speech or, you know, um, being a part of a labor union or a political party is that with religious freedom, you're aligning an individual's conscience with some external reality. It's not just a political party, it's something outside of this time and space that we live and exist in that orients the individual to an eternal future. And so that's a very different, that's a very different concept than just something that's here and now. And it, it, it orients and shapes how we live our lives because of what might happen in the afterlife. Let me really throw a wild card at you, just get your reaction. A few years ago, I heard uh, uh, Congress, not Congressman, um, Cardinal Dolan of the Roman Catholic Church make a nod toward the past history of his church. He said, uh, Catholics once held that error has no rights. Well, they don't hold that now. Error has no rights. Mm -hmm. and, and in the secular history, I, I, you know, I've thought back to the, uh, the German Nazi experiment uh, in Germany, communists had no rights. Well, you and I can easily see the problem of that political viewpoint, mm -hmm. but to say that anyone that believes that view, no matter how sincerely or sincerely mm -hmm. wrong, as a human being, they lose all their rights. That's sort of dangerous. Oh, and I think yeah. we've flirted with the idea, and I'm really going to go out on a limb here now. <laughs> President Trump, I think, got caught in, in his words on the uh, thing in Charlottesville. Mm. But there, he was close to a truth. Not that there's necessarily good or bad people, but even when people are holding a bad cause, you can't just wipe them off the scale of, of, of their human rights and respecting them f even in their wrongness. And we're close to it. We've, with the terrorists, we've, we've crossed the line, I believe. If someone is identified as a terrorist, human rights don't apply. You can pull their thumbnails, their fingernails out, you can skin them alive, you can, they're worthy of death. Well, <laughs> and I think they're all connected. I think what's at stake yeah. Is, 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 a, is a, 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 a broad based view of, of respect for human life just because it's human life and, and what goes with it, views that are held sincerely. It, not that you have to uh, follow them or, or hold them up as something ideal, but that person is, has the same innate rights as you or I. Right. Well, at Hardwired, we believe that every person is hardwired for Yes, freedom, I like that concept. For, for dignity. We believe that every human being is made for freedom and dignity, and that's the yeah. goal that we're trying to accomplish in the world. And that's very biblical from a Christian perspective. Of course, and, and, uh, but it's universal, Christian, and Christian human rights are universal. They um, are universal ideals and standards that we should seek for every human being because of the inherent human dignity that they possess. Yeah. Uh, so this is something that we're striving towards. What we see in America today, um, particularly amongst uh, younger generations, is that um, there's a lack of awareness of these human rights and how they apply to a lot of the things happening in their lives today. So, I mean, just you mentioned President Trump and the issue at Charlottesville over race, but um, if you if you look at a lot of the issues that we've seen in the past year from the the, the anti-Semitism that was in Charlottesville to um, the immigration, th you know, the challenges to immigration and the fears yeah. that a lot of um, Muslim immigrants had of of the policies and how it, how it portrayed them. Um, you have a lot of concerns across the aisle uh, in diverse communities over what's happening in society and how it's affecting their 
their religious um, identity or their religious freedom. And so I think for the first time, we have a conversation in America. And that, that could be good. That can be had about yeah. how does religious freedom, this freedom of conscience, how does it apply to everybody? And how does society navigate it in a way where, uh, where, where everybody is able to achieve greater dignity and respect and not yeah. less? Yeah, well put, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's a big challenge and, and uh, human, uh, Humans throughout history haven't navigated that very well. Mm -hmm. uh, it seemed easier to different cultures when, when their political and, 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 and ethnic identity was tied up with their common religious identity. Mm -hmm. But now we're so bifurcated on many levels. Mm -hmm. We're a, such a diverse group that, that we have to figure it out, don't we? Right, well, and I think it's important. When, one challenge we've seen is that people don't understand the fears that people have from a diff different political perspective about um, about losing their religious freedom. So, you know, conservatives within the healthcare um, climate were very fearful that they would ha be forced to violate their conscience by paying for abortifacient drugs. And, um, you know, if it was a Jehovah's Witness that had to allow their child to be given a blood transfusion or if it was uh, Adventists that had to work on the Sabbath. I mean, those are all, those are all violations of conscience. Yeah. Um, at this, in the same way, uh, a lot of conservatives don't understand how how certain young people are protesting about the fear, uh, the changes in immigration, how it feels that certain um, communities, religious communities are being targeted. And so, uh, and then at the same time, on top of all of that, you know, there, um, there are legitimate reasons that we need to prioritize certain persecuted religious communities in our refugee policy, because that's a long-standing you know, American tradition, but it seems to be something that hasn't really been discussed in the whole immigration debate either. Yeah. There are a lot, so there's a lot of issues going on on both sides, and I think the important thing is that there needs to be a real conversation in America about why religious freedom is something that is for everyone, not just for one group or the other. And I don't think, back to something I said earlier, I don't think that conversation is being directed very well because uh, and its present administration, admirably, have, have, uh, the president personally has said very clean, clearly that he's going to support religious freedom. Mm -hmm. That's fine. Uh, but when I see what's happened more recently in the United States, a lot of it is religious entitlement. It's more power to a certain religious viewpoint. I don't see an increased emphasis generally on an inclusion and. Uh, you know, our, in, in the Seventh Adventist Church, there's a great suspicion of ecumenism, which is sort of a word we use, don't use anymore. It's, they take it as syncretism, where you sort of put all religions in a pot and just stir them. I don't think anyone that deeply cares about a particular religious faith wants that. They, that what they hold, they hold dearly and closely, and it's very important. Uh, so it, it should, to me, it's a little troubling when I see a particular religious viewpoint particularly one that's more easily identified with historical nature of the society in a country. It's getting more and more empowered, but maybe the others are losing out. So, Well, I don't I, know. I mean, ultimately, in America, as in much of the West, more and more people are becoming non-religious. So well, that's another threat, so th yes. but, but I mean, so I don't know that, that focusing on religion so much is as much as is as important as understanding that there are a lot of people that reject religion that are becoming secular and there's a clash between the two and within those two contexts we need to understand that both groups re require and um, should have the freedom to decide whether to follow a belief or not follow it and that within that you can't force people to um, to to, to do things that would violate and, their And you're onto the key thing. There's not to be force. If there's force right. involved, it's not religious liberty. We'll be back after a short break. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Liberty Insider. Before the break uh, with uh, Tina Ramirez, uh, we, were, we were really focusing more in on the United States and religious liberty here and, and what's the state of the union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, obviously, it's always going to be because of the Constitution and our history, uh, something that's, that, that defines the United States. But I think there's a little ambiguity moving in, isn't there? People aren't real clear. And, and as you, I think, privately said, this is a, a society where people don't always define themselves by religious identity. A lot of secularism, 
but uh, there's good argument for secularists to uphold religious freedom too, because it's part of the glue that yeah. binds society together, right? Except possibly in one place. I mean, one of the most religious places we have in America right now is probably in football. <laughs> yeah, you can't. Well, but we you could say sacrilegious. You, 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 can't, you can't watch a game without, I mean, it, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, it's sacred in America in many ways. Yes, but, it's, it's, but, it's its own religion. But how often do you see them very, um, very honestly and, and just um, boldly sharing their faith, you know, in public? I mean, that's one of the few places in public life that we see it yeah. where no one's going to say anything against it. Uh, you know, it's, it's refreshing in many ways that, yeah. you know, that anyway. It's not all bad, but... Uh, no. uh, I'm inclined to lump it in with what the Supreme Court called, uh, not that, but other uh, public religious displays, calls them ceremonial deism. Right, but what we see, though, in that is that it's still part of the culture, that, yes. that, you, that there is still a religious uh, aspect of the culture and of public life that you, yes. can't, you can't completely stamp out. And so in our well, culture, we definitely, you see a lot of the media that wants to um, secularize the public space, but, yeah. but there are certain things that, you know, just will never... You know, that or another way be. of putting it, which I, you know, I came as a teenager for the first time to the U.S. from another country, and in, in Australia, not a very religious country, anyhow, people don't particularly want to talk about religion. It's off the table, mm -hmm. but in America, still to this day, it's an acceptable topic. Right, right. So there's not public embarrassment about religion, mm -hmm. but I, me personally, uh, I think religion shouldn't be associated with football games and so on. <laughs> And, and when I hear a preacher on, for me on sa Sabbath, Saturday, if he starts off with a sports example, I switch off. <laughs> I figure he's mixing sacred and no. profane too much for my liking. But what I mean is you see a lot of professional athletes very expressive of their faith yeah. in a way that the, cultural, the culture is generally um, antagonistic. Like The culture doesn't want yeah. us to be public about our faith. And yeah. so you see these attacks on religion and public life in, in many, in many so you've got the major immigration case that went to the Supreme Court a couple months ago of the baker and uh, over whether the baker should be allowed to um, choose to not um, perform a service for somebody that would condone, condone a, a sacrament, a religious sacrament that violates their faith. Um, and so your public expression of your faith, can you, you know, it, can you, can you do it in, in your... issue involved. Right, right. I, I, at the same time, it scares me. I think some of it is what I call religious entitlement. They're not concerned for the other person. They're wanting to sort of shove their view down, down so, the customer. Some people might see it that way, but some people might see it as, yeah. I mean, ultimately, if you, if you have, um, it, you should not be forced to perform an act that would violate your no. conscience about a specific as a, as a matter sacrament. of principle, that's absolutely right. true. No, it doesn't mean that you don't serve the person in other ways, but it just means that when it comes to a religious sacrament, that's a different yeah. standard that yeah. would be applied than a general, you know, a general cake for any other purpose. And I, I think that's the challenge is that in the public space, we see um, that we see um, a lot of a lot of conflict or you know confrontation occurring when you have equal. Uh, um, equal opportunity, certain rights coming into conflict like marriage rights and other sexual orientation rights. And so we're going to see more and more of that in the future. Well, yes, yeah, the conflict of rights, absolutely. Uh, yeah. You've had a, an interesting career so far and it's hardly over, <laughs> just beginning, I guess. Yeah. But, you know, you've worked closely in Washington. Explain some of the mechanisms we have and that you, you've seen and where we are now on, right. on uh, government support and protection of religious liberty. Right. Most people are probably not aware that the United States government actually has a pretty robust policy for protecting religious freedom mm -hmm. internationally and globally. And so in 1998, we had the um, International Religious Freedom Act, IRFA is what it's called for short of 1998. There was a, a bill to reinforce IRFA that was that was passed last year in 2017, the Frank um, Wolf uh, Religious Freedom Act. Yes, and I never thought of it as a follow-on to that. It's, yeah, it was. A, it, it, it basically bolstered the original IRFA right. Act of 1998. But um, under IRFA, what it did is established a State Department office focused on religious freedom internationally. And so now every embassy in uh, every United States embassy in the world provides a report specifically on that country's uh, respect for religious freedom mm -hmm. as a human right. And 
it's, I mean, it's a very extensive report. You can, you can look it up on the State Department's website. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, there was a, um, an ambassador appointed to oversee that office. And um, we've had several ambassadors in that position over the last uh, almost 20 years now. Isn't and that long, yeah. and then, and then in, the, in the coming weeks, we'll see the, new, the newest ambassador that President Trump has appointed um, be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So that's going to be Sam Brownback, the current governor of Kansas. Then in addition to that, we also have, um, under IRFA, was established a commission that's an independent body that was that reports to Congress um, and provides recommendations on what countries, based on the State Department reports, should uh, be sanctioned because their violations of religious freedom are so egregious. Now, the, now the commission, though, is, it reports to Congress, but it was within the State Department, isn't it? No, it's not within the State well, Department. I thought it was. I no, know. no. So the State Department have its, has its own office, and then the commission is just an independent body. It's, oh. it's not necessarily a government agency even. It's just an independent government yeah. commission. Yeah I, yeah. yeah, I know there was a little, it wasn't a direct line of communication, but I did think they were within the department. Well, that's good. Yeah, so they report to Congress and they provide a report. Yeah, like year. ombudsman almost. Usually I think in May, May or June is when the reports come out. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the State Department's report just came out on who they're going to name as countries of particular concern. And once they've named a country as a country of particular concern or a CPC, then that country requires that the State Department and the Secretary of State take certain actions, including sanctions, but it could be other actions to help that country move from an egregious violator of religious freedom into a better uh, position. So it, the goal was really to try to get countries to remove themselves from the Yeah, to, to, to move towards greater respect for religious yeah. freedom. But we've had IRFA since 1998, so almost 20 years, and we haven't seen, um, we haven't really seen a large change in many countries. We've had certain things happen, but then in top of all of that, you have Congress and you have what they do. And so the U.S. Congress has many members that are very active in religious freedom. And when I was there, obviously, you know that I helped found and direct the International Religious Freedom Caucus mm. that included members from both sides um, of the aisle, so half Republican, half Democrat, that uh, focused on religious freedom issues. Now there's a con congressional subcommittee on r religious freedom, wasn't there too? No, so there's a subcommittee that handles human rights. Uh, what, what was uh, uh, Congressman uh, Frank, Frank's, uh, he was chair of some? The caucus. The caucus, okay. Yeah, yeah, so that was the yeah, caucus the that we started, caucus. and we started it in 2007, so it's been going for over 10 years so now. So who, who is uh, yeah. dealing with that now? So the current um, chairs of the International Religious Freedom Caucus in Congress are Congressman Gus Bilirakis of Tampa, Florida, yeah. and then on the Republican side, and then uh, Juan Vargas and... Um, uh, Emmanuel Cleaver on the Democratic side. Good. And they're both, they're all great members of Congress. They've done a lot of great things. Emmanuel Cleaver was a former uh, Methodist minister, so he was always a lot of fun to work with. And Yeah, uh, no, I, I, yeah. I'm aware of him. And Vargas yeah. has a very large Iraqi so, Christian population, so they're both very active on so, this. So, you know, the U.S. is, is like all human uh, structures or, or conglomerations. You know, it has its ups and downs, but structurally, I think it's great that we have the ambassador, we yeah. have the uh, the uh, uh, commission and, and, and then supporting yeah, it's uh, a very groups in, active. in Congress. So uh, we have a mechanism, even though at various times, I remember one Secretary of State went to, uh, to China and said openly that, that r r r civil liberties were not really going to be on the front burner that visit. Right, Secretary you know, those, Clinton. Yeah, well, I didn't want to name <laughs> You know, that, that was unfortunate. But in yeah. the long run and in the, in the aggregate, the U.S., I think, is clearly taking a lead in civil and religious liberties, yeah, and I pushing can, other countries. And I can definitely tell you that in the time that I worked on these issues um, under former President Bush and then under President Obama and now under President Trump it, with the U.S. Congress, that there has been um, a difference in how each administration handles it. So ultimately, mm -hmm. what you see is that when it's a priority of the administration, there is a lot more emphasis in the embassies on addressing problems quickly and succinctly. But when the administration doesn't make it a high priority, it, it isn't taken as seriously. And it takes a lot longer to get people out of prison or to address dangerous laws in certain countries. So it makes it very difficult for the people that are being persecuted or suffering on the ground. I think that um, under President Bush, it was a high priority. Under President Obama, it was not one of his top priorities. He had a lot of other issues um, like women's rights and other rights that were more important. And under President Trump, we haven't really seen where that will play out. We know that it's a priority um, 
in the, the UN, but not necessarily, we're not sure in his administration where that would fall. There's a lot of talk of late about making America great again. Different people mean different things by that. But when America's greatness is truly analyzed, it must be recognized that it's not military, it's not necessarily economic, it's the greatness of ideas. And one of the greatest ideas that has characterized the United States from the beginning is a not always realized but a constantly restated affirmation of the universal rights of man, and in particular, the right of people to religious freedom. Of course, true religious freedom only comes directly from God. He gives and no man can take away. But for a country and a constitution to acknowledge this abiding reality is what has made and will continue to keep the United States great. That is something that needs to be realized and no matter what the government does and how it projects itself, it must be kept great for religious liberty. For Liberty Insider, this is Lincoln Steed.